Welcome to another episode of Fight the Burnout. Uh, this is going to be uh, episode three of uh, of the new season where we're interviewing law enforcement and first responders. Uh, today we've got a special guest coming in from uh, C- uh, over by Seattle in uh, Washington in the U.S. Uh, and he is a 27-year veteran, uh, left the job just not that long ago, about June last year, uh, after taking some time, but he was a uh, Seattle PD for, for that, did honor guard for all of it. He was just telling me before about um, how he got into it in the first year, so we'll get him to tell that story again because it was pretty inspirational. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we've got Clayton Powell here, and, um, yeah, thanks for being here. And no problem. We'll, yeah, tell us a little bit about that honor guard again, just because it was it was it was inspirational around you know why you got into it and how you got into uh, it as well. So my last day of field training and the first day that I was actually out there by myself was June fourth, nineteen ninety four, uh, and myself and and the squad that I was with uh, in our North Precinct went out for uh, our honor guard, not honor guard, sorry, our um, field training. Uh, party celebration to making it to full fledged police officer. So I get pulled over on the way home by one of our troopers, I guess, you know, he just wanted somebody to talk to. I don't know why he would talk to me, but anyway, I guess I was going a few miles over the speed limit. And uh, so he asked me, so how's your officer doing? And I looked at him inquisitively and said, I don't, what are you talking about? I have no idea. He said, one of your officers was shot at the next exit at the next off ramp. So I drove home, not thinking anything about it and woke up the next morning and called the, uh, the South Precinct and asked, you know, what happened. And they told me that, uh, yeah, and, uh, Detective Antonio Terry had been shot the night before and didn't survive. And he was the only person I knew on the police department at that time. Wow. Uh, he and I worked as, as kids together at a McDonald's south of Seattle. And, you know, we stayed in touch and I knew his family and uh, it, it was it was heartbreaking. And uh, the last FTO that I had was a member of our of our honor guard, and when they were going through the rehearsals for the memorial planning, uh, I asked them how could I be involved in that, and uh, a few connections were made. And the supervisor at the time, the honor guard, uh, did me a, a, a did a, a quick interview with me and had me march a few steps and said, "Okay, see you at the next practice." And it was a career long endeavor. So, wow. Yeah. Wow, and I bet you met a lot of really cool stuff and was able to impact a lot of people with that. Um, it was... How do you get through that? Because you what you were only about a year in the job, you said? I, I was, no, no. I was uh, literally just started. My last day of field training, which was three and a half months on the department, and uh, that happened. So it was, it was one of those things where you don't understand what this job I- entails until that ultimate event takes place. Um, and unfortunately, I, I I got to chew it the first, literally the first day of being a, a full, full-fledged full sworn in police officer uh, to be able to work on my own. And that's, unfortunately, that's how it went down. Mm-hmm. So, how'd you, yeah. how'd, you move, how'd you move through that? Because I know I haven't had to do that. A friend of mine who we had a shooting last a uh, couple years ago uh, mm-hmm. here and a cop, a cop got killed and a friend of mine actually was shot. I went to call, I went to police college or, um, as you call it, academy in the U S um, yeah. with, with him. Uh, but how do you get through your, you know, the one guy that, you know, friend from young, you're just out of academy field training and you, you, you experienced that so close to home. how did you work through that? And you know, what, what did you do to, to move through that? I, I, I think because um, I was just starting and I didn't really realize the magnitude of what that was and what it meant and what it means to go to work every day and not know if you're going to go home. Mm. It's uh, thinking back on it. I think just having close friends that weren't police officers to talk to about it and also who knew Antonio, uh, his his, uh, sister and I still keep in contact. Um, unfortunately, his younger sister has since passed away a few years ago. Um, so I still stay in touch with with the family. Um, a lot of the officers that I've gotten to know on the department were close to him. So uh, it, it's just one of those things you somehow work through, and without even even realizing it, you've you've gone through it um, to the point that 
you you come to some resolve with it. Um, it's impossible to pass by that exit off the freeway and not think about it. Mm. So um, every time I, I'm anywhere near that, uh, that exit off the freeway, that off ramp, and it's just the thought mm. comes to mind, you know, throw a couple of peace signs up and go, hey, man, still thinking about you. You know, so and it's been that was 94. So coming up on 28 years, something like that. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. That's that's nuts. Um, what you what you what, like what you learn from it as a as a young officer? Um, what did you you know, I, I know for myself, at least when things would go wrong or when I'd hear about something going wrong, I'd want to know about it so that I could then make sure that I didn't do it. Did you have any of that with that? Oh, oh yeah. It's um, because it was the way that scenario unfolded. Uh, he was getting off the off ramp, saw a car that was broken down and went and went to, to assist what he thought was a broken uh, disabled motorist. Uh, turned out to be some local knucklehead gangbangers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they recognized him because he was in a plane car um, and in his detective uh, role. And he recognized them, they recognized him, and he kind of called no joy and went to walk back to his car and drive off. Well, they shot him in the back. Um, he returned fire, injured one of them. Uh, the calls came out because it's kind of near a residential area. And he drove to the end of the off ramp, took a left hand turn to go to the precinct because it was it's what he knew, it's what his mind knew. Yeah. Uh, supposedly, according to some of um, those who were uh, in positions of rank at that time, if he had taken a right and gone to the fire station, he'd still be with us. But wow. in, in your, in your mind, you, you, you go to what, you know, yeah, you got autopilot. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so that's how that went down, you know? Yeah. So what'd you learn from it? Like coming out of it, you know, being a young uh, man, what'd you implement into your career from it? I'm not, I'm not stopping to help anybody unless I can see who they are before I get to them. Um, <laughs> And I actually caught a little, a little flack from my sister one day because me and the family were driving driving home from some event in Seattle. And she said, look, there's a car. Aren't you going to stop and help him? You're a police officer. I said, no, I don't have a uniform. I don't have a patrol, patrol car. I don't have overhead lights. I'll make a phone call um, you know, to, to get some assistance if they need it. But I mean, if I see a little old lady and it's, you know, it's obviously somebody who that's you know, not going to pose much of a threat, then yeah, I'd stop and help out. Yeah, but yeah. if I just see a, a car broken down on the side of the road on the freeway, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I, I, I may, I may help you as, as much as I can roll down my window and ask if you need some assistance, but you know, you have to kind of j judge these, these occurrences as, as they come, you know, yeah. and yeah. Th those kind of, you, you learn from, I'm not going to call it a mistake, but you learn from, from circumstances that, you know, that unfold from, other officers being involved in something. So yeah, that kind of changed my mindset as far as stopping stranded motors just when I wasn't working. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's fair enough. That's fully, you yeah. know, fully understandable. And it is, it, it is, you know, as, as we know, um, the, you know, the most dangerous things are traffic stops and domestics. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, Stop two. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so those are the two most dangerous things. So if you can eliminate some of that risk, then, you know, right. then you make sure you go home at night and at the end right. of the day, it is important to you know, right. look after yourself because you're, yeah. you know, you're what matters. Uh, so tell us, obviously we're here to talk about burnout, uh, as an officer, uh, I find wow, like so many, I think I heard a stat the other day that something like already six or nine cops have already taken their own lives this year in the U S. Um, and I put it down to a lot of burnout, that PTSD, that stress that causes a lot of that burnout, causes you to lose a bit of who you are. Right. Uh, tell us a little bit about experiences with burnout yourself. Um, I've seen it in, in other officers more than myself, but there was a point where I realized that I had been in patrol um, too long mm -hmm. and I was getting burnt out, uh, a combination of work and the commute to work and uh, relationships at work, relationships away from work. Um, and I asked to get out of patrol. Yeah. They told me, no, there's sorry, there's, there's no place we can put you. Um, I would say literally within three months, I got into an incident and uh, the department thought that it was going to be uh, a big to do. Uh, and so I found myself out of patrol the next day. Uh, <laughs> 
miraculously, they found some place to put me. <laughs> and it was a rather high profile event um, right after the DOJ landed in our backyard. And uh, it was probably four years before uh, I was back in patrol again. I was still working in a patrol capacity with patrol units, but in plain clothes and doing menial tasks, you know, going to gather evidence from complainants or something like that. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's amazing how when you ask for something, it's not available. But then when something negative happens that might bring embarrassment to the department, all of a sudden there's some place to put you. Yeah. The unfortunate part, of, the unfortunate part about that is, is uh, it, it kind of ruffles some feathers. Mm. You know? So, you know, it is what yeah. it is. Yeah, it is yeah. what it is. Yeah. So a few questions on that one, I guess, is what was it that you identified? You know, you know, you were like, I need to get off patrol. What was going on that made you realize, hey, I, I need to get off. I need to get out of the off the street, off of patrol for a while. I would just say the cumulative stress. Um, you can only see so many homicide scenes. You can only see so many, respond to so many domestic violence scenes. And you just think, you know, I, I need a break from this. Um, things in the personal life weren't the best. Uh, and, and all of a sudden you just realize, I need to get away from this. Hmm. Um, I, I, at that time, I wasn't seeing a therapist, but I, I recommend any officer that starts out Get yourself a good therapist as soon as you get started, even if it's just to go talk to somebody. You don't have to talk about what's going on in your life, but have and also develop, keep maintain those friendships out of out of police work. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. When you look around and you see that you're spending 90 percent of your time with people that do the same thing as you, you're never leaving work because the conversations are going to go toward work and some call that you went on or something crazy like that. And the next thing you know, you just you're involved so deeply in police work that you don't have any time away from it so yeah yeah no nah, definitely so you had this incident that happened we won't go into details on it because it sounds like it was something that was pretty deep um but you had this incident that happened what did you do after that to, to to help prevent yourself from getting back to that stage where you were when you're like hey i need to get off patrol you know what was the things that you what did you shift and change in your life um Uh, at, at that point, I did start seeing a therapist. Um, that's one thing. Uh, and, and that was that was a very positive move on my part. Um, I just started, I guess, slowing down. Hmm. Um, you get to a point where when, when you so I'm, I'm going to I'm going to back up to the beginning of the career and then work my way that way. Cool. Real quick. Perfect. So when you when you get into this job, as you know, you you want to go to everything. You want to go to every call you can go to. You don't want to take time off from work because you're enjoying the job so much. You'd almost do it for free. Yep. Um, yep. So there, there's in the beginning, I would say the first three to five years, newer officers. And I came on, fortunately, when I was 32. So I didn't come on as a 22 year old. that was gung ho to go through everything in the world and 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 uh, save the world. So it was a matter of understanding myself and realizing that I need to take time to look in the mirror and do a self-examination and say, you know what, why, why am I feeling all of this stress? Mm. And like I said, it was a combination of a whole, a whole bunch of stuff and the accumulative stress that, that you go through and it builds up and it builds up and you don't check it, you don't recognize it, then all of a sudden you explode. And that's where I was and I was at that verge of exploding. Um, and, and it was just, you know, Sarge, I need to get out, I need to get out of patrol. And that incident happened. So, but I, I just think it's, it's, it's really imperative that you maintain friendships away from the job and learn to recognize the things you got to know yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also important for supervisors to understand um, this is a 20, I think at the time I was on 20 years, this is a 20 year vet that has said to me, I need a break. Yeah. And when they can't figure out a way to give you a break, I think they do their 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 employees, their subordinates uh, a disservice. Yeah, no, it, it, it is. You know, if somebody's coming, if somebody's coming to you say, you know, I remember when I I didn't need a I didn't need a break as such at the time, but I, I was. No, I did need a break and I was making a plan to make a break and. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> I went to my supervisor and I went, this is what's going on. This is what I'm putting in. Um, and this is, this is what I, this is what I need to do. And I watched him when I told him what was going on. I watched him kind of get pushed back like, whoa, okay, well, wait a second. And at this time I was looking after the prime minister of New Zealand. I was here when not armed all the time, but I was armed. I was, you know, with, when I was with the, with the, you know, VIPs and that, and I watched him go, oh crap, I don't know what to do. <laughs> besides, <laughs> besides shift me to someone else. <laughs> And for me, right. I look back on it, I go, wow, I felt like a slap in the face. I felt like, you know, the, the one guy that's supposed to be like, oh, whoa, okay, cool. I, I get it. He went first into, um, first into, uh, are you able to work? I'm like, right. well, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm here. I'm working. And, you know, and it's, it's like, it's like that that whole thing of you know am i going to cause something am i going to do something which i guess is in a good is is a good way and a bad way at the same time but just the way that it happened and then he just pawned me off to the welfare person um okay. which which was quite i mean it was good in one way but it, it felt like a pawn off like a oh okay i can't deal with this so i'll just give you to somebody else um i don't know if you felt that at all but um that whole listening to, I think that that listening as well is, is so important. Did you have anybody else that you were working with that you identified that they were burning out and you had a conversation with them? Oh yeah. Yeah. There was uh, one in particular. Um, and I'm not going to store his name out there, but we went through the Academy together. Um, and, uh, I'll say at this point, I went through the Academy twice so I consider myself twice to cop everybody else's. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would, I would pull him aside and he was one of those hard chargers, former military guy, um, basically wore a uniform his entire life. And I just pulled him aside a couple of times. Just, hey, man, you need to slow down. Uh, we were on the same air, but not at the same precinct for a good part of our career. So we would hear each other, but he worked one precinct. I worked the next. We just shared the same radio air. And um, I just, you know, I was just like, man, you need to slow down. I, I, I can hear it in your voice. I know you, you, you. You talk to people when we're hanging out off duty and you bring up police work. Um, you get into a confrontation with somebody and you ask them, you better not have any warrants. Dude, no, uh-uh, no, no, stop. Let's check this right here because I don't want anybody knowing I'm a cop when I'm hanging out in plain clothes. I wasn't one of those, you know, we call them badge foreheads, you know, and um, it, it's like you have to be able to separate and he couldn't. Yeah he'd be driving home and talking to me on the phone and he would, you know, make comments about this fool better slow down. I'm like, what are you talking about? This guy's speeding down the freeway. Hey, you're off duty, drive home, you know? And, you know, it's, it's, you can't turn it off, but you can turn it down. Yeah. You know, you're going to pay attention. You're going to have your situational awareness at all times, but you don't have to, you know, simulate traffic stops while you're driving home in your personal car after you get off work. So, uh, Unfortunately, that friendship suffered um, partly because of that. And, yeah. you know, we're not as close as we used to be. So yeah. it, uh, it, when you start recognizing in people, um, that also makes you look at yourself uh, back to that again. So uh, I just made sure that I paid attention to what's going on around me yeah. when I'm off duty. Uh, yeah, well, there are times when I, you know, within those first five years that, you know, I would pull up next to somebody and badge them because I'm, you know, Billy badass with the, you know, with the police title and that kind of thing. No, not a smart move hmm. because you don't know what somebody just did and you don't know how they feel about the police. And now they have your license plate and, and your, what your vehicle looks like and who knows what can happen. So. Yeah. It's being, a, being aware, but also turning, you know, and, and turning it off at times. What did, did you do anything specific or did you learn anything, you know, you know, in the early career, in your early career to, to do that, to actually turn it off? Um, I observed other officers doing it and, and looked at their behavior and uh, I didn't want to be like that. Mm. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to be that guy that took his radio, his portable radio home every night and called in traffic stops um, or called in observations of what, you know, traffic was doing or somebody speeding. I just didn't want to be that person. Um, however, there, uh, there's still that community caretaking portion of it. If you see something that's just, you know, criminal and, and, and 
it, it, it makes your antennas go up. Yeah. I'd make a phone call. I wouldn't go contact anybody, but that's what any, that's what any, you know, citizen would do to, if they saw something criminal taking place. So at that point, it was to a citizen making a phone call. So uh, I like it. Did you do anything? Um, cause I know sometimes like, I know some officers I've talked to and even, um, I learned it after I left, sadly. Um, but doing some sort of thing like having like a ritual when you would get off duty to make sure that you you know you had that specific thing of okay, cool, I'm off, I'm off duty. Or did you have some sort of ritual that you did? Yeah. Um, one one of I had a cousin who was a, a one of the first black officers in Detroit back in the 1970s, wow. and uh, he and I had a few conversations. And one of the things he told me his golden rule is leave work at work and leave home at home. So when I was, when I would leave home to go to work, um, sometimes I'd have a dog, sometimes I wouldn't, I would look back and say out loud, I will be back. So that's getting my mindset, you know, tuned into I'm coming home at the end of this shift. Um, when I would leave work, uh, um, I would do that in reverse, um, and say, I am now leaving the city. Um, thankfully nobody could hear me because I would literally talk to myself out loud in my vehicle. I'm leaving the city. I'm going home. And so that's, that was my ritual, so to speak, to yeah. separate the two. Um, and I mean, it's it, to that relationship thing, you know, a lot of people have relationship issues and I would tell, you know, whoever I was with at the time, that look, I'm not going to pay a lot of attention to my cell phone when I'm at work, if I'm out in the field. So you might call me. Um, if you call two or three times, I'll know that there's, there's something urgent and I need to call um to call you back or to communicate with you but you have to be able to separate that someone else's need to talk to you versus your need to stay safe mm. so yeah and that's that get back home kind of thing yeah did you start that before or after that incident oh it was before i started at the beginning of my career yeah. you know yeah. um yeah it was just, like i said that that that's the one the one uh, tidbit of inf uh, advice that my cousin gave me that stuck with me my entire career. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So w after the after the the incident happened and that was there anything like if you went back if you could go back pre that incident and obviously we can't change anything and what's happened's happened and it's happened for a right. reason. But right. if you could go back now and tell yourself before that incident, you know, when you were like, "Hey, I'm burned out, Sarge. I need to get off patrol." Uh, if you were able to go back and tell yourself something in like the beginning of your career that could have prevented that, what would it have been? Um, well, the, a little premise about that incident. It was one of those things where we were dealing with something and, you know, you get that, that confrontational invitation. Mm. I'm going to see out that gun and badge one day. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just said, why don't we just make it today? Peel this <laughs> off, peel this off and let's, let's get down to it. Um, unfortunately there were cell phone cameras all around and, you know, it, 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 it got to, to just about here before it got really bad. Yeah. Um, so I went through some disciplinary processes and, and those kind of things and procedures and, um, was actually fired, but got my job back. Um, so the one thing that I told, um, I think was one of the captains or one of the assistant chiefs is if I'm feeling that I'm not coming to work. If I feel like this again, I am not coming to work because I was not in a good place. It was one of those dark times where, you know, I think probably 95% of officers go through them. Yep. Um, the other 5% just don't admit it, um, you know, and, and it's it's 20 years in patrol. I, I don't recommend it, you know, mm. yeah. it's, it's, it's longevity. Did you have any days where you didn't go in after that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely. definitely how'd you get past because i know there's so many especially in the beginning there's so many um officers you know I'm, I'm thinking about those guys that are just in you know i did seven years and so you know i'm in that stage where you were like that 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 three to five seven ish i kind of classified it, it was all in that same area where it's still that that enjoyable you know you see so many people leave at seven years you know because they start to get that kind of thing uh, yeah. so like, what am I going to actually do with my career? Uh, but if, if we think back to that, you know, so many of those are like, and even I had the same thing back then is I don't want to let the troops down. If I don't right. go to work, I'm going to let the troops down. Not so much the community because you're like, well, there's always going to be, there, but I'm going to let the troops down. I'm going to let the boys down. Yeah. 
What do you have to say to those guys after going through, you know, 27 years of a career? That's that's a massive career, you know. A lot of guys just dream of having that. What yeah. do you say to those guys that are in the beginning that are have that mindset of, I don't want to let the troops down, and so they'll go to work when they're in that state of, because that's some great advice about, <laughs> don't go to work if you feel like you're going to smash somebody's head in pretty much. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then that, that, that little voice in the back of their head goes, oh, but you're going to let the troops down, so you, you have to go in. What do you say to them? We'll be fine. You take care of you, you take care of home. We're going to be fine. We won't deal with anything that we can't handle. So, um, and I think that's one of one of the benefits working in a large municipality is you have officers within within minutes and sometimes seconds away. Whereas if you work for a county or a, you know the troopers, then you're out there on the road by yourself. Yeah. Um, there's there's always going to be somebody available to to be with you, and we're gonna we're gonna get through it. You know, um, I I tell people the same advice that my cousin gave me. If you got stuff going on at home, take care of that. Mm. Don't come to work and bring it here because that means you're distracted when you get here. Yeah. Um, and that's the time that you're going to miss something that you should catch or you normally would catch and somebody's going to get hurt. So, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's quite interesting. I teach all my, um, all my clients that want to become cops or even people that are in just, you know, you know, high busy in my productivity, you know, coaching program. I always right. teach them to live by a pyramid. So I've created this pyramid that I, that I, that I live by. And after going through everything I did is the base level, the big level, you know, the bottom of the pyramid is the biggest base level right. is yourself. Look after number one. Yes. Uh, and then the next level up is uh, your relationship. So your intimate relationship, look after her or him and, and, you know, really look after them. And then it's kids and uh, you know above, above that. And then it's your, your close family and friends. Uh, and right. then at the top is everybody else and work. Right. So many right. people, especially officers, flip it upside down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that job is what I do for a living. It's not how I live. Yes, yes, I love that. I love that. Um, so yeah, no. Nah, um, so uh, Clinton, um, I love to ask people what their why is. I've come to the realization after a lot of the work that I've done on myself is, uh, you know, we have an identity, but we have an actual deep identity. And I was just thinking about today, listening to some, doing another program that I'm part of. Uh, and it kind of clicked with me that your why is almost like your true identity. So that true purpose, that true why I call it your true why. And it stems back to childhood when you, st you know, when you're young, probably something negative or sometimes positive has happened and you just concreted that in their mind to create less pain. Didn't recognize it when I was in the place, but man, I wish I had known that my why was to create less pain for myself and others to become the best version of ourselves. Uh, but Clinton, what would you say your why is that you've had for your, you know, your entire life that's ended up, you know, making you such a great cop for 27 years? Ooh, one I haven't thought of. Um, you know, I, I think for me, it's family. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm very close to the females in my family, um, partly because the males weren't really there. Um, so it was kind of ingrained in me from my grandmother down to now my niece. Um, you know, family should come first. Um, fortunately, having this profession and being able to um, take advantage of some lucrative opportunities within this career, you know, off-duty jobs. Um, if somebody in my family needed financial support, I could work a few extra off-duty jobs to help them out. Mm. Um, didn't have a problem doing that. So I think my why is, um, ironically, my mom said um, at, a, at a gathering after I retired, she said, uh, I can get off my knees now. My mom's really religious. Mm. Um, so I can get off my knees now. They're tired. And now that you're retiring, my knees will feel better. And it didn't really dawn on me what she, what, you know, what she meant until probably days later. You know, she's probably playing, praying every, every night that I went to work, every day I went to work or whatever else. Um, I'm not a religious person. I'm, I'm more based on karma. Good out, yeah. good in, bad out, bad back in. So, um, so that... I have to say that my why is family. family. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Um, awesome, man. Well, and how do you find that helped you through your career? Um, after my son was born, um, I, I, I think it, it was, it, it, it gave me a sense of, um, paternal pride. You know, I'd never planned on being a father when I, in my late teenage years, you know, it was one of those things. I don't have any kids, man. Kids are this, kids are that, whatever. I don't, 
but when he was born and, and I, you know, I, I had that much more of a reason to get home mm. um, after every shift and it just kind of watching him grow up um, and, and, and seeing that there was somebody else that depended on me, you know, another extension of family. So yeah. Um, yeah. Not it. Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. I, I, I love it. It's, um, do you miss it at all? Right now? No, but the part, the part that I don't miss is, is the drive in. Um, so like I said, I left no, uh, no beginning of November of 2020 and I, I didn't make a drive to Seattle, um, for probably three months. And at that point I was missing it because my part of my structure was, you know, um, disturbed um and the integrity of, of that structural life was disrupted so i'd get up in the morning oh, so what am i going to do today and i don't have to drive to work but then three months later i made that drive to work and i got halfway there and just was like literally how much further do i have to go yeah I'm so programmed to make that 30 mile drive you know for 20 something 20 almost 30 years that i didn't think about it when i was doing it but yeah. then when I was away from it for several months and had to make another drive, it, it, it was one of those things that it was a trigger. Yeah. Um, this was part of my stress, you know, driving to work every day. Um, but I miss the most, I, I miss the coworkers, yeah. um, you know, the friendships you make at work. I miss the community that I was close to. Uh, I still stay in touch with several of them because that's what I did at work. That was my focus, you know, taking care of the community. When I left, I was in the, the community police team. Yeah. Um, so I didn't answer 911 calls as a, as a steady um, part of my job. Uh, and I was actually the, the mobile precinct operator, yeah. you know, so you take the big bus out or the big vehicle out and you set up posts and, you know, people come ask you questions. You have communication about the job and about whatever, bring whatever. Some, bring some humanity to it and instead of just seeing exactly. the bottom 10% of society all the time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So Good way to we, finish your career. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's one of those exit positions, you know, yeah. if you're fortunate enough to have a connection, and I was um, with the precinct commander that that brought me into that. Um, when I had a conversation with him, like, I'm, I'm out of here in about three or four years. I'm so, yeah. okay, so give me a call next week. And the communication took place, a conversation, hey, I'm, I'm having this mobile precinct delivered to the precinct, so I want you to come be the driver for me. Sure, no problem. No problem. So, so yeah. that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so you, you got out, you started getting out June 2020, or sorry, November, 2020. Yeah. Right in the heat of all the craziness that's going on at the moment. Yeah. How was that in the, with the burnout side of stuff and the, the work and, and all of that over there? It was, <clears throat> it, it was the discouraging part of it was losing support from the city leadership. Um, we had some um, policies that were, let's say, altered to the point that it, it kept us from doing the jobs that we knew we were supposed to do. Yeah, you guys um, had a lot of, in Seattle, you guys had a lot of stuff in 2020. Yeah. Um, the, I think the biggest, the biggest losers in that were the taxpaying citizens who lost their police department. Mm. Um, because they were not getting the police services that they deserved. Mm. Um, you know, when you have to wait um, for three hours for somebody to come to your, to your house, uh, when you come home and your house has been burgled and, you know, you, your, your whole world's turned upside down. So to us, it's a common thing, but to, to a victim of a crime, it's the worst thing that's happened to them. And, you know, they're, they're hung in limbo because we don't have enough officers to, to respond to their call, to, to assist them with their needs. Um, then you have the worldwide um, vision of just corruption and not corruption, but disturbances taking place everywhere. And we're handcuffed, we can't do our jobs. Um, and we're, we're told not to do certain things that were normally part of the occupation when I first started. Uh, you, you, you not, don't arrest people for this. Don't arrest people for that. Don't 
do traffic stops for minor things. Well, well okay, well then take them off the books and we don't have to worry about it. You know, so, <laughs> I can you, hit, hit delete and we'll just won't right, think about it. It'll right. just be out of our brains then. <laughs> right. If you give me if you you give me a, a violation and it's it's a means of contacting somebody, then you're telling me not to do it. What you're saying is don't do your job. Yeah. Um, and then we have the COVID thing hit and that's a whole nother mess. So it's just it, it became, I just, I'll keep saying it. It just became discouraging to the point that, you know, why am I here? Yeah. If I can't help the citizens, why am I here? Yeah. So, yeah. so what'd you do to, is that why you got out or was there other reasons? Uh, there, there were some internal reasons. You know, there, there were some internal reasons. I, I, I was doing this job for, like I said, the X number of years and, um, the one thing that I found was micromanaging became a style of leadership. Mm. Um, and when you have a supervisor who is two levels above you, but you've been doing the job 10 years longer than they have, there's not much that they're going to tell me about how to do the job. You can tell me what you want done at the job and then allow me to go out and do it my way. Um, as long as my way isn't causing any embarrassment to the department or violating any policies, but let me do the job my way, because guess what? It's worked for me for 20 plus years. Yeah. Um, so there was some frustration with that. Um, and I just, you know, some of the old guys who've been retired for decades say, you know, you'll know that you'll know you when your last day is, you'll, you know, exactly when it is. And I showed up at work one day and just stopped and said, why am I still coming here? And that was my last day. And wow. it's, it, it was it was so such a um, a profound thought that I just kind of smiled because somebody said this day's coming, mm. you know, and and um, it, it just got to the point that it became overbearing. Yeah, you know, yeah, the the no. mistreatment of the community. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's the one. It starts to it starts to get to that, doesn't it? Um, just last couple questions I have for you because that brought up a few things for that I wanted to kind of question you know ask you about how did you work through those times because i know november wasn't quite the whole big intense side of it was after that it was sorry that was after the whole big intense shutdowns of parts of seattle and things like that and you know government doing weird things to you guys you know to officers and that over there how did you deal with that like how did you make sure that you it didn't get completely underneath your skin and you just be like what the you know screw all of this um, conversation after conversation with people that are going through the same thing I was, mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, your, your, your coworkers. Um, and I, I mean, I'm, I remember having conversations almost daily with an officer who was on, you know, three to five years. And it's like, Hey man, how do you, how, how, how do you take this? And my generation, um, of policing started, you know, back in the nineties, we were encouraged to do our job. Now we have, um, like I said, these changes in policies that uh, it, these youngsters come on um, with the idea that they're going to be gung ho and go out there and do this, this job. And no, this is not the time for that. Yeah. The hard charging days are over. Now it's more of, you know, showing some compassion for people that are going through hard times. Um, we don't ever encourage or encounter someone who says, Hey, I'm having a great day. Can you have a police officer come by and, and talk to me? You know, I want, to make him, I want to make him cookies and give him a cake. Right. right. You know, we deal with people when they're either victims of crimes or, or, or we're contacting them because they're a suspect in a crime. So when we encounter people, they're not at their, their highest points in, in life. And um, you have to be able to rationalize that and navigate your way through that process of, you know, look, this is somebody who's down on their luck. Um, or they've been a victim of crime. You have to show some compassion when you walk into um, a household that's, you know, somebody's broken their, their kicked their door in and, and come in and just gone through everything in their house. Um, it, there's some compassion for that lady who's stealing groceries at Thanksgiving to feed her kids. You know, you, mm. you have to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes in order to completely understand what they're going through. Yeah, I got the uniform on and I'm, I'm wearing the badge and I'm driving the police car. But guess what? This is another human who needs help. Mm. So um, there's there's that part of it that uh, a lot of people don't think about when they get the job. Yeah. So. So did you just start to reiterate and have conversations with people about that? 
about about what about I just said. That. Did you, about about just having that compassion with people with everything that was going on, the micromanaging, the the you know the the being told you're not allowed to really do your job because I don't remember I was sitting over here and it has trickled down over here and I have lots of friends that are still officers here and my best friend is and it started you know and it's that that whole they didn't want you guys doing what you you know as you said do to do your policing um so was was it just communicating with other guys around that just making sure they're just shifting what you were focusing on or what was it that you know what were the things that you guys started that you started to do um, or that, those communications that you were having with other officers around that? Um, j- just try and uh, understand where they are. Mm. You know, as somebody who's just starting to do this job and you, they've been doing it for three years and um, I, I know you want to go out and, and, and do the job the way that you think it's, it should be done, but you have to understand where we are in history mm. with all that's gone on since, you know, that fateful day in May of 2020 yeah um and uh it's just a matter of realizing that you can't save the world you know you come out here and you do what you can but yeah. guess what your most important thing is is getting through this shift and getting home so you have to kind of rethink um and, and we became like firefighters you know we stay at the precinct until there was a call and we go out handle that come back uh i don't like doing that because that's not how i started doing this job you know we were encouraged to be out to be seen to be visible because just seeing yeah exactly (laughs) just seeing that just seeing a police vehicle might prevent a crime from taking place there was there was um one of my sergeants actually told us about that because they they were talking about trialing because we ride two up here in auckland uh, all the time and uh they were going to trial doing like one up type things and and just send two cars kind of like they do a lot of places in the u.s right and um we were talking about it. We're like, oh, you know, safety, blah, blah. They're like, yeah, but the thing is, is that if there's, there's proven research that I think it's like 80% of crime will drop just by driving a car through. Like it's an 80% chance that if you drive past someone who's thinking about doing a burglary or something in that area and he sees a cop car, just drive past. Yes. It, it it's, it's like an 80 or 90% chance that he won't actually commit crime in that area. He or she. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's something to that. Um, yeah. No, awesome. Well, Clayton, thanks so much. I have one last question for you. I like to finish off my episodes with this one. What is your top tip to self-happiness? Um, man, I ride a Harley, dude. So, <laughs> <laughs> so right, I ride, I ride, I ride motorcycles as well, man. So, I, I totally can get that. So, so to, to have that outlet, that, 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 this is me. This is my element. This is what I do. This is what I what brings me enjoyment. Um, so, to 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 have a dry day, and this is not my favorite time of year here in Washington State, <laughs> no. because it's it's that hundred days of gloomy with three days of of sunshine and dry weather thrown in. So my riding days are kind of limited. But um, have an outlet, man. Just have something that that is that you do to make you feel happy. I don't know, be it hanging out with friends, you know, getting together with your significant other and just going to do something simple. Um, but it's, it's important to know yourself and, and what makes you feel good. So that's it. I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. And I can totally relate with the motorcycle riding. That. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you earlier when you said you drove the Southern, Southwestern States, but we skipped yeah. right over. I, I I I rode the Southwest states. I should say I bought a, a Yamaha uh, uh, V Star eleven hundred. Okay. Because um, I, I was on a budget, paid three and a half grand US for it. Rode it around, sold it for twenty seven hundred dollars after eight thousand miles. So. Um, hey. <laughs> yeah, it all the way from Northern California to Houston and back. So. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Put some time in. Put some yeah, time. Puts, in. Longest day was 750 US miles. So, yeah. Uh, from yeah. just outside of Austin all the way to the middle of New Mexico. That was a long day. That was 13 hours yeah. in the saddle. Yeah. Just, yeah. So, just yeah. Enjoying, the, enjoying the air. Yeah. Oh, you just do. You just enjoy it. Even when it got hot and it was Phoenix, it was like 120, I think it got out to. And I was black leather jacket and I was like, mm-hmm. I'm riding and I'm hot. I'm like, I want to take this windshield off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so but yeah no uh, awesome so top top tip is do something that that you enjoy that you're passionate about i love it um yeah. well clayton any last words before we wrap up um hey man all those 
those that are still out there doing the job, be safe. Um, because right now times are just, they're crazy. And, and, you know, just pay attention, be safe and get back home. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, well, thanks again, Clayton. Uh, I really do appreciate you being here and being so open and, and vulnerable in some aspects. Uh, and, uh, Again, you know, for the listeners that are listening, I always say this, just take one thing away from this. That's all you need to do is take one thing. It'll change you, your trajectory just by a couple degrees. And you keep doing that over days and days, you know, imagine two degrees in 365 days. If you can continue to compound that it just keeps changing. So, you know, yes. take just one thing. You can re-listen to these over and over and you just keep grabbing new, new little, as I call them nuggets. Uh, right. I, know I, I heard a lot. There's a lot of things that I, I know, but sometimes just hearing them again just reconcretes it in. Uh, yeah. And if you do need some specific help, obviously we have programs, we have coaching, we have uh, things that we can help out with. So you just have to email us at team at uh, createfromy.com uh, or you can just uh, go to createfromy.com itself. And, uh, you know, we've got a productive AF, as I call it, or productive as fuck. Uh, so we can become productive as fuck within. Yes. Uh, so we can be productive as AF um, from when in, so that then we can do it externally. You know, especially as law enforcement first responders. You know, we we yeah. so as we talked about even, you get so externally driven that you lose yourself within. Uh, you start yeah. to become that person that you don't like. So, uh, right. but till next time again. Thanks for listening. Uh, we really enjoy it. If you do know a first responder or a police officer that would love to, you know, tell their story, talk about, you know pick you know pick brains and, and have a conversation like this please just let us know and um, yeah so next time we'll talk soon and again thank you clayton you're very welcome all right chris